So here we go. We can have a start. Everyone, this is Mark Rosardo. He is uh, board of directors for Sport NBC and also a physiotherapist with a very long list of accomplishments. So I'm going to let Mark tell you all the things that he's amazing at. I've watched uh, I watched a YouTube video of you actually the other day with the Falcons. You're, uh, you were mic'd up as you were coaching. Uh, this year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think so they, like took a long, and a half. they took a long time to edit that. I think. <laughs> Yeah, it's about two and a half, three minutes thereabouts of of you coaching. So it was, it was quite fun. But I will I will let you uh, take the floor and uh, tell everyone who you are and what you do and uh, talk us all through some common running injuries. Okay, thanks for uh, joining us on uh, Sunday night. If you have any questions as I go through, uh, don't be afraid just to um, shout them out. There's not very many of us on the call, so that's actually easy. So, um, so we've asked, been talking to uh, the most common injuries that we see for runners. And right now, most people are training either for the sun run in mid-April or the BMO in uh, early May. And so uh, we're getting a wide variety of patients uh, coming in. Um, so we're just going to go through some injuries that I see in the clinic and that are you know, pretty prevalent. It doesn't matter what the season is if people are running. Uh, my background is uh, I've got a diploma in sports physio on top of my uh, three other degrees. Uh, I do functional needling, dry needling in the clinic. I've been the lead um, therapist for Babton Canada for 2012 to 2019, um, a chief therapist for Canada at the 2010 and 2012 Olympics, as well as the 2007 Pan Am Games. And then I was with the men and women's soccer team at different times uh, since 1980, 1979. And as Jeanette just said, I'm the head coach, have been the head coach at Langara College, except for a five-year gap since 1986. That's the men's team. So my background is uh, various sports. Um, I personally am not a runner, runner, but I prefer it right now because of... Uh, you know, bum knee is to cycle. I uh, have no conflict of interest and there's no reimbursement for this presentation. So hopefully the, by the end of the talk, you're going to learn uh, what the most common in running injuries are. And hopefully you're going to learn the various techniques that you should see when you see a physiotherapist or any type of therapist uh, with regard to running injuries, including the different types of treatment you might run into, such as manual therapy, various modalities, specific exercises, that go far beyond the basic strengthening and stretching exercises that you might get. So the first thing you should ask yourself is, uh, do you really have an injury? Is it just muscle soreness? So if you crank up your volume, um, say you're going uh, 5K three times a week to eight to 9K three to four times a week, you're pretty close to doubling your volume. So once you start doing that, you're gonna, you might end up getting some what they call muscle soreness, and uh, two days later, it's called DOMS. You, if you look it up, D-O-M-S, delayed onset muscle soreness. And that's pretty typical. And so major muscle groups will come in and you'll hear people say, you know, I've done these new exercises. I've gone to a new exercise class and I've got, you know, I've, I've used muscles that I've never knew I had. Well, that's what, that's what DOMS is. And it usually shows up about 48 hours after you've done the event. So if you go for a fairly long run on a Sunday, say you're doing, you know, a 15K, you might feel the effects of that on Tuesday. So that might be your recovery day. So you might want to uh, take, you know, do some type of run or a cycle or a swim on the Monday. And then Tuesday might be your day off uh, where you uh, want to tone down the for sure the mileage. Sometimes it's quite obvious if you got an injury. So anybody guess what that is? You better, they're probably, they're probably got a mute. Okay, that's a torn hamstring. So uh, this person is a client of, was a client of mine and he has torn it right where the insertion, I'll go through some anatomy in a few minutes, the insertion of the, anat of the hamstring right where you sit down on ischial tuberosity. 
And then when you see that, it's not uncommon for that bleeding to go all the way down to the foot. So people kind of freak out sometimes when they see, you know, bleeding into their calf or into their toes even. But that's just the normal way that uh, the blood flows out of your system. So uh, don't panic. If But if you do have it, <laughs> you definitely need to make sure you see somebody. Uh, you don't want it to... Um, can gel or become a hematoma, which is a, a sack of blood in a in one area. Because if it gets hard, then sometimes that could lead to uh, problems down the road, like uh, myositis ossificans, which means that instead of healing like muscle tissue, the tissue heals like bone, and you end up with a bone inside a muscle. And a lot of professional athletes, it happens a lot, not as much in the hamstring. It happens a lot in the quadricep, the front muscle of your thigh. And it led to people having to retire from their professional sport. Um, so you just got to keep an eye on it. Sometimes it's not as obvious as the one I just showed you before. Again, this is the same injury, but you know, you see them, some discoloration on it, but it's not as dramatic as the one we just saw. Okay, so if you see it in a calf, because we see a lot of calf injuries, uh, you'll see it in the actual calf itself, or you may see it bleeding into the Achilles tendon or actually into your foot. So what you got to make sure is that you uh, know where it's coming from. So if you go in to see somebody and they say, they look at your leg and they go, oh, right away, you know, this is where it is. This is where the issue starts from you know, that's not necessarily a good way to assess it. And if they do that, you might want to just get up and actually leave the clinic <laughs> because they should do a full assessment of your lower extremity, starting from your back and work your way down. They may end up obviously right at your, your, your calf or your hamstring, but they should look at your back as well. So that's for sure should be part of the assessment that you're getting. You got to be open-minded as a, both the athlete and as a therapist. Uh, it, not every injury is exactly the same. So you got to make sure that uh, you're able to change and see the big picture. And uh, I did a talk for Manchester United about five, six years ago in Manchester. And I have to say that the uh, therapists that were working for Manchester at the time were very close-minded. So they didn't want to try... Um, they didn't want to try anything new like IMS, like we're talking about in a minute, or they didn't want to try any manipulation techniques. So I think what we need to make sure is that uh, the therapist and the client both have an open mind of what the issue is and how to treat it. We're just going to go through a series of athletes here, and uh, you got to make sure that as uh, you know, people come in, they say, you know, this person was bowling. Is that an athlete? Well, I consider anybody that does anything active is an athlete. It doesn't matter if you're five years old or if you're 85 years old. So just picking up uh, this person, actually, you can't see their head, but they're actually picking up a, a napkin off the floor with their with their uh, mouth. Uh, then you see Milos Ranek, who I worked with in 2012. You know, he's a big guy. He's like 6'5", 200, and I don't know, 230, maybe 220. And he's, he's a very big guy. And so, you know, it's a lot easier for him for to tr strain a muscle than somebody that may not be as uh, lengthy. Then we have the pentathlon that I covered. And, you know, they're doing a whole bunch of different events. They're going from fencing to swimming to jumping, uh, equestrian. They run and they shoot. And so they could have a wide assortment of injuries. Um, and then his are badminton players at the Olympics. And they have a lot of issues. And uh, basketball players, same thing. They tear their hamstrings all the time, calf muscles. There's our women's soccer team over in England. And then there's our runners. And actually in the middle there is my daughter right there. And she's running the Boston Marathon right there. And then here's our cyclists. Again, different types of muscles, but they, probably, along with hockey players, probably have the biggest muscles generally of any athlete that I've dealt with. So the muscle lesions, typically the big muscles are the hamstrings, which are the back of your leg, the quadriceps at the front of your leg, the gastroxoleus or your calf muscle, and then the adductors, which we'll talk about in a minute, are the inside muscles of your thigh. 
And then there come a couple other common injuries. You, a lot of people get stress fractures, and that would be in the tibia, which is your lower big bone in your lower leg. And then you also, in the fifth metatarsal, it was just below your small toe and your foot on the outside. Okay. So some people have, uh, somebody may step on them. They may uh, evert or they have a inversion sprain of their foot. They may step on something uh, or it's an overuse injury. So both of those areas are prone, prime, sorry, prime areas for stress fractures. If you end up with a stress fracture, you're going to have to modify your training program. So I, I rarely tell people to stop training. So I'll, you know, early on, I might get you on a bike and I might you get in the pool, but you definitely cannot continue to run. Uh, and for sure, you cannot continue to run at the volume or intensity that you've been doing. And then you have tendonitis, which is the inflammation of a specific tendon. And I'll give you, like I said, I'll show you some uh, pictures in a minute. Tibialis posterior, if you run your hand down the inside of your lower leg, inside of your big bone, that's where tibialis posterior lives. And so it'll come down the inside of your leg and go around the inside bone of your ankle. And then it dives into your foot and attaches into 29 different places in your foot. Really important muscle gets in, um, a lot of people don't look for it, so you don't see the problem, but responds very well to some of the treatment we're going to talk about in a minute. The infrapatellar tendonitis, that's right below your kneecap. So that's the tendon of your quad attaching onto the uh, lower bone, and it's called the infrapatellar tendon. So right underneath your kneecap as it goes down, if you tighten your, if you put your hand underneath your kneecap now and go to lift your leg off the ground, that's the thing tightening up under there. Then you have peroni, which are the outside muscles of your calf. So again, you run, you put your hand on the outside of your of your lower leg, and then try and just bring the outside of your foot like out, and you'll feel it contract. Okay, that's usually a problem with the person the way they run, or if they're pigeon toed, they usually uh, can get that. If they're supinated or pronated in their foot, that means they have a high arch or a low arch that can affect the peroni. And then the big one that we see all the time is iliotibial band syndrome or the ITB. And that attaches, if you look at your knee right now, if you're sitting down, you put your hand in your, where you think your knee joint is and you just go south of that, like towards your foot. And right there is the attachment iliotibial band on the, on the far side of your leg. And if you stretch it out all the way to the top of the crest of your pelvis, that's where it starts. So it's a fairly long uh, fascia that drives down the leg and attaches just below your knee. A lot of people come in thinking they have a knee issue, um, but it's not. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Okay, so these are the muscle groups that... Um, on the left-hand side, you'll see quadricep muscles. So there's four muscles that come into your, to make the quad. If you look at the far picture on the left, you'll see, I don't know if you can see, there's a, can you see my pointer there? Yeah. Okay, so that's the infrapatellar tendon right there. There's your suprapatellar tendon. It doesn't really, you don't really get a lot of issues with that. And here's your quad tendon, your quad muscles. Everything in red are muscles. All right, so you got vastus medialis, which is the big one in the inside. Vastus lateralis, the one in, outside. Rectus fem is the big one in the middle. And then underneath everything is you have mass, vastus intermedius. So those form a tendon right where my um, pointer is. And they control your what your kneecap does. And your kneecap has to go up and down a specific groove. If it doesn't track properly, it gives you issues. And then you might hear a click or you might find some pain there, especially if you go down hills. So if you're running a lot of hills, if you live like in New West or North Bend or even parts of Burnaby, uh, parts of Vancouver, and you're running a lot of hills, um, you got to have somebody look at it because you may have to change your uh, change the way you look. Now, I'm not sure. Can you see the hamstring muscles? I thought everybody on the Zoom, can you, you can see it? Okay. On the right-hand side, there's three muscles that attach to the back of your leg, and that's your hamstring. So any one of those three can get torn. 
if you look at the picture I'm putting up right now, that's your hamstring. So we're looking at the back of the person and in yellow on the far left-hand side, you'll see that's a ham that's a semimembranosis. Where, my, where the first circle, the top circle is, that's what they call the tenomuscular junction. So that's where the muscle, which is right in here, becomes a tendon. Okay, so the, you got to understand the anatomy is that every muscle has at least one tendon on each side of it. So there's a tendon up here and the tendon down here. Tendons are not very well supplied by blood. So they take a lot longer to heal than if you tear it in the middle. So when you see somebody and they tell you that the, they think the tear is in the muscle belly, which is in the middle, like right here, then that's a good sign because it's going to heal faster because the blood supply to that to that belly is way, way better than having it at the tendon, okay? So there's three different muscles in the back of your leg and a therapist should be able to identify which one you've injured and do specific exercises. They're all slightly different, okay? There's a hamstring. This is the adductor. This is the muscle I was telling you about on the inside. A lot of people miss it but it goes, it's part of the, it can be part of the hamstring, but it's more like to the inside of your muscle. And that is important because when we talk about in the middle, when they do the assessment, they may see something in your back that may trigger why you're getting a hand injury. Because if you've been a, an elite runner, say, or even semi-elite, and there's no real reason for you to all of a sudden have a hamstring injury or a quad or, you know, why, why am I getting that injury all of a sudden? So uh, maybe something went wrong. Maybe, you know, you're running and then you miss a step, like you're in the trails and there's a pothole and you missed it or you're running on concrete and you go off the sidewalk and you miss the step. Then your pelvis gets thrown out of whack. So if we go through why the culprits of a hamstring injury, there's a number of them. One is it could be coming from your back. You, you know, if you, uh, you're getting some pain from your back leading into it or your spine is out of alignment. It could be because your pelvis is malaligned. Okay, so not just your back, but your pelvis. So almost all the muscles that we're talking about. So the rect all the quadricep muscles, the hamstring muscles, the adductor, they all attach on the upside of your body on the pelvis. Okay, so you, you might go to some people and they go, oh my gosh, like you've got like a quarter or a half an inch leg length discrepancy. But if you correct the pelvis malalignment by a manipulation by the therapist, you're going to fix that leg length di discrepancy. So you got to make sure that that gets looked at by whoever's treating you. You could have muscle imbalances if you tear your hamstring. So maybe your, your muscles, you know, like a lot of hockey players don't do a lot of strengthening of their hamstrings. They do a lot of quad things. You know, you sit down in a bench at the gym and kick your leg out against resistance. They'll do that until the cows come home. But they don't lie on your stomach or I'll show you in a minute some specific hamstring strengthening. So you may have your muscles being way stronger in the front and then they'll just blow out your hamstring as a person um, person's running. You might have just pure muscle weakness. Maybe you actually injured it two years ago and then do the proper rehab on it. And now you've decided to do the BMO or the sun run and you're cranking up your volume. All of a sudden the weakness comes to fruition. One of the biggest issues is muscle inflexibility. People do not stretch enough. It doesn't matter if it's your calf, it's your hamstring, your quads. I'd say the hamstring is probably the least flexible muscle amongst runners. And so a good way to uh, stretch it is I'll show you in a few minutes, but you need to make sure you're flexible. And then, you know, you should have a uh, good core strength just for general good health, but also just so that everything is moving in, in, in synchronous in synchronicity synchronicity. Here's your core strength. This is my trip to Bali. What do you think? Core strength? Yeah. The guy on the left was amazing. Like he, like it was unbelievable. Like I, we're on scooters. He uh, is riding this bike. You can't, when you're from behind, you can't even see him. And he's got his um, hay and all his parcels and everything going. And these women on the right side, you know, lots of times they're even carrying their, their young ones with them. 
I mean, it's, it is great. You know, they don't have to go to the gym and do any strength training. So we're just going to quickly talk about some vector stuff that we, you know, some theory on, on how we, uh, or anybody that's really treating anybody at a, a specific level should use. We use force vectors and anatomy slings. So when various force vectors are balanced, everything moves properly. There's no issues. And when there's an imbalance of the force vectors, it leads to some type of malalignment, especially pelvis. And so and I'm dressing, it does happen on, on men on the malalignment for sure, but especially women, especially if they've had some children and they may just getting back to running now, there could be, especially if they're still breastfeeding. So they'll, the, the tendons will still be loose. And so they just got to be careful that their, say their pelvis isn't malaligned and we're looking for stability. Okay. And so that's got to be looked at and that should be part of the history that that client is giving the therapist and the therapist should be asking about. Gluteus maximus is obviously your part of your glute eye. They're extremely, extremely important. And so um, sometimes when people have an injury, this gets loose. You got to remember that you can lose 40% of your muscle strength in 10 days. So post-surgery, we see, we see that a lot. And so even if you have um, an injury that may happen two weeks ago and you thought to yourself or your doctor tells you uh, or somebody's told you to stop running, uh, you're going to lose a lot of weight, uh, a lot of muscle strength. And so that's why I ask people to do something different and cross training. So swimming, cycling, something where you're not going to use that muscle group necessarily and definitely uh, not loading it. These are the vectors. This is the uh, various vectors that we look at and how they all compare. I'm not going to go through everything, but you can see that from the front that everything is attaching onto the pelvis, which is right in here. You got vectors coming up from this side and your abdominal wall is coming in. So typically, if somebody comes in with a, say, let's just talk about a calf. Somebody strains their calf. We're looking at the entire at minimum, the muscle, the joint below, which is the uh, the ankle, and the joint above, which is your hip, and the pelvis, and then join in with all our strength exercises will include at least that area. You should include, like I said, some core strengthening because it's all going to be part of the entire part. So you can't just look at your calf and say, okay, I'm just doing these exercises to strengthen my calf. It's not going to happen. You, it's not going to be su successful. So if you look at the posterior obliques, what they call the posterior oblique sling, the muscles that include where you may have some weakness is gluteus maximus, which we talked about, latissimus dorsi, which are the muscles that are right along here, the lats, okay, back here, and it attaches on your shoulder, and tensor fasciolata, which is the, similar to the ITB, and it comes down the outside, okay? And it's used a lot in the stance phase, like when you're landing on the right foot, say, that's when that muscle posterior oblique sling is using, and cross-country skiers use it a lot as well. Then we get the deep long longitudinal sling, which is the deeper muscles. So muscles that include erector spinae, which is right in here, starts from your pelvis all the way up, and those are attaching right at the bone level. Multifidus, the same thing, thoracolumbar fascia, sacrotuberous ligament, and bicep femoris, which is one of your hamstrings. And that's the when we're looking at unilateral side or you know, strengthening on one side of the body only. Okay. The lateral swing is on the outside here. And that's when we're looking at muscles that include again gluteus medius, and that's part of your glutei, tensor fasciolata, and your iliotibial band. And so a lot of times when I see patients, this pelvis is out of alignment. That means that the muscles are feeling they're, they're attaching a little higher. So every stride that you take, you're feeling this tight and you're feeling pain down here and the, where it attaches just below your knee. And that's when people come in. When they used to be doing the 20, we used to cover the 24 hour uh, run. They used to run out of swan guard. And if people, like people run in that, and they're like, people are like, oh, I haven't run in six months or a year. I haven't run in since last year's 24 hour marathon, you know? And they all come in. And we used to have a thing right on the wall because so many people came with this complaint 
And the issue was the iliotibial band attachment right there. And so when you see them walk, they kind of have this walk where they're limping and to the one side because there's weakness in that glued area right up here, okay? So as a runner, you might see that if you start getting pain in there and you start limping, that could be one of the issues. So pelvis malalignment, that means the issues, the, I go see my hands here, the, the, the pelvis has moved. It can move like this, it can move this way, or typically it moves up. So if you've moved, if you've been running and you missed that step, like we were talking about earlier, it might look like if, uh, if you look at your, the crust of your, of your pelvis and you look standing straight, you might look a little higher on one side than the other. Or if your person has any bumps in their low back, you can see those bumps. They're usually the, the SI joint and they're usually like side by side. And sometimes it's a little elevated on one side. Okay. So that per, the therapist, whoever's looking at you, should be able to assess that. They should be able to fix it. They'll do a simple manipulation, it takes like seconds to do it. Uh, and then you, hopefully you reassess it and you give them some exercises to make sure the pelvis stays where it's supposed to be. And then uh, I usually don't get them to run for a couple of days after that. I get them some exercise, st stability exercises to do at home. Then I get them come back in two or three days I reassess it. It should be good. You may have to do another manipulation if it didn't keep it there. And then you move on. They should be able to uh, recover quite easily. These are some of the hip stabilization exercises uh, that we have. Uh, one of my daughters is showing here. So this is hip abduction, abduction. That's you stand on one leg and you move the leg out and slightly back. Okay. So what I'll tell most of my patients is that I don't want them hanging on to like a chair or a, a pole while they're doing this, because when you're strengthening, say I'm looking at the hip abduction here, right? If you go to the outside here, even though you're strengthening this leg, you're going to feel on the glute on the left side, the one you're standing on, you're going to feel a lot of uh, activity going on there. And that's exactly what you should be feeling. Then we put them on the hip extension. So when you do a hip extension, you should always be on a slight riser. It doesn't matter how high it is, just so that your foot clears the floor and you don't have to bend your knee. Okay. And then we're doing hip flexion where you're just driving the knee up as if you're going to hit somebody in the groin with your knee. That's the easiest way to explain it. So those key muscles are surrounding the hip and they're going to help stabilize that hip, especially if you have something wrong with the pelvis, uh, like on the alignment of the pelvis. Like I said earlier, typically there's a facet joint. That's where the bones meet in the back, L5S1. And again, the treatment is you manipulate it, you provide some stretches for the muscles that go around it. And uh, what we do do in our clinic, most of our therapists, unless they've been uh, new grads, uh, which can't do it for two years, We'll use uh, functional dry needling, which is a dry needle. No, there's no medication in the needle. Uh, it just goes into the muscle to relieve the stress or the spasm of it. Uh, it can be uncomfortable at times, depends uh, how tight it is, but super effective. And then for sure, you need to do the strengthening of the low back muscles. Okay, so you kind of have to do the stretches, the strengthening, uh, all you know within the same day. Okay, so this is a person doing some easy stretches. You see their hamstring here? See how bad it is? They're stretching the front leg, okay? Six weeks later, we showed them how to do some stretches. This is the same guy, okay? So you have to do the stretches. You have to do them right. So what I do is I give you a hamstring stretch. We'll do the one on the left here where you, you're on a riser again, it doesn't have to be very high. You definitely don't wanna be any higher than a step. You put your foot down flat, don't bring your foot up. So a lot of people do it with their foot up, like facing up and you don't wanna do that because your calf is gonna restrict you a bit. So if you put it flat on the ground, turn it in just slightly, your knee stays straight and you're bending from the pelvis here, from the hip and you should go down. 
If you're really tight, you're going to be in this angle. If you're really flexible, you're going to be down here somewhere. Okay. On the right hand side, we're teaching them how to stretch this quadratus lumborum, which is the muscle in the back, back here. And so we'll be, he's going to be doing the left one here. So let's uh, play it. This goes back to the left and then he moves his left hand under and you'll feel it on the back side of your glute and the lower back. Okay. So this is dry needling, um, or it's called IMS by a lot of clinics. And we'll do, there's various ways of doing it. Sometimes we'll leave them in for a few minutes, uh, or you, you can just put them in like I do, and you move them up and down and you take them out. And sometimes we actually connect an electrical current to them to contract the muscle and then release it. So it just depends on uh, what technique your, your therapist wants to use. Uh, like I said, it can be painful at times, but typically, especially once you get used to it, it's actually uh, beneficial and it's effective almost immediately. Like as soon as a person walks off the table or not walks off the table, jump, gets off the table. Okay, some of the other uh, treatment modalities we have here, this is a uh, infrared laser. So this is a uh, infrared light that we're using to stimulate blood flow to that hamstring. These are electrical muscle stims that, uh, oh, sorry about that. These are electrical, this is connected to a muscle stimulator. So we'll contract the muscles. So that person is doing this movement over here. All right. So this one here, we're doing some transverse friction. So say the tear, we think the tear is really high up and where the uh, tendon attaches, say the hamstring. We'll do, we'll go across the tendon and create friction there so that we can draw some blood there. So like I said, the goal for us is to increase the blood flow to the tendon or to the area we're treating. So you'll see us put a laser there. Uh, we'll get you to do some active uh, exercises. If the person has a sprained ankle, that happens quite a bit as well from runners. Sometimes the joint at the ankle is uh, stuck. And so we have tested it. We'll think that is jammed at the joint itself. And we'll just do a, a manipulation of it. It's really simple, pretty effective. And all of a sudden the person can bend and do a full squat without having an issue. So that would be an issue. Like if you couldn't bend that foot very well, Going up and down hills is not good, especially going uphill. We're using uh, shockwave uh, a lot as well. So that's what I'm using with my hand there. And again, we're doing it to try and decrease the spasm of the muscle as well as bring some extra blood into the area. For sure, it can be painful. I'll tell, I tell most of my patients right off the hop that it's gonna be painful but within five to six visits, you should see some results. You actually should see more results, let's say the second and third visit, and it should be done by the sixth or seventh visit. You know, taping, sometimes yes, and sometimes <laughs> no. And if you look at the one in the middle, that's a lot of tape. So if you see something like that, maybe give her a nudge or him a nudge and say, you might want to take, sit this one out. The tape is not going to prevent you from hurting it, but the tape will give you that reminder that you're going too far. Your stride is too long if it's in your calf or in your uh, in your hamstring. And uh, there's different ways to tape it. Again, depends where the issue is. This one, the tape, the issue was at the top of the leg, and on this one, the issue is by the tendon by the knee. Okay. Ice is always uh, useful. These are my badminton players and ice bath. Uh, you, you probably hear about that all the time. Uh, the ice bath, uh, you know, anywhere between six and eight degrees and you're only in there for three to four minutes. All right. In the clinic, uh, when I travel, we have that. Now, we did it with the women's soccer team on a regular basis. Uh, this is a, a game ready machine that we have in the clinic. Again, compression and ice. So if somebody's got a, a hamstring or a calf, or a just a knee issue, then we usually use that at the end of the day, at the end of the treatment. Going back to the IMS, I'm just gonna quickly, so when, uh, one more I think. 
Sorry about that. So one of the one of the things that's really effective is if a person has a torn hamstring, calf, or say tibialis posterior, this is the money treatment right there. Get it done early. And if you can isolate it where it is, especially tibialis posterior, you're going to loosen that muscle and life is going to be way better and it's pretty quick. Um, I actually had a person do this. So they hurt their knee and then he came in and he had gone to a medic who, you know, I call it medic. I don't, I, I don't know what he is, but the person actually cut a small, like a incision into this guy's knee and then sucked everything out of that, which means he sucked like all the good tissue as well as some fluid probably right out of it. So uh, that happens, you know, just walk out of the clinic. That's not a good idea. And when I told him that, you know, the chances of infection are really high, um, he kind of like, why can't I just, I just can't believe you don't do it. So anyways, make sure the communication is, is open from, uh, from, you know, the therapist to you uh, as, a, as the client. So you know exactly what you are in our clinic. Uh, I tend to go through all the exercises with the, the client in the, in the clinic, and then we'll give them a hard copy of the exercises, as well as we'll send them an email that they can uh, have on their uh, phone or their whatever they're using when they go to work out that's there, and they can just remind them of what they're supposed to be doing. And make sure the communications that, you know, make sure, okay, you can run. But I want you to sprint to like your heart rate is 150, not 180. You, you don't want to be doing any hills. And uh, one of the classic ones is uh, this one I have, <laughs> I use quite a bit is Brian Cliss is a soccer player. And, uh, you know, that's exactly what happened. So you guys make sure to find out what you've got. You should, you know, therapist should be able to tell you most of the time what the exact injury is. How long do they think you might be out? and how you they think you're going to get there. Is it going to take a week? Is it going to take six weeks? Uh, should you forget about uh, planning the trip to run? Or yes, you'd be fine as long as we do the uh, following things. Make sure that uh, what you're speaking to the clinic is the same language that the therapist is using. So if you don't understand terms they're using, like tendon, you don't understand what that is, ask them what it is. If you don't understand what, uh, you know, a ratio of three to one is, then ask them, you know, they, they say, we want you to run for three minutes and walk for one. Uh, make sure that's very clear. Okay. Some of the back strengthening exercises I thought I'd just touch on because uh, most people are going to have some type of issue. You, you can start with some easy bridging and then you make it a bit more difficult with uneven surface. And then we do a bridge and uneven surface. So we just go from easy to a bit more difficult, a bit more challenging. Uh, in terms of strengthening, hamstrings are usually absorbing uh, deceleration from a sprint. Uh, so if you guys, you know, if you're a strong runner and you're actually gonna run the sun run and at the end of it, you wanna sprint home, you gotta just be careful, but uh, you know, you should be able to do it. Things have changed. If you, uh, you know, went to a physio uh, 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, and uh, they gave you some exercises. Things have probably changed since then. The way they treat you probably has changed a little bit. And if it hasn't, then uh, you should move on to somebody else. These are some of the strengthening exercises. Uh, passive, this person is just pushing, like this is the, the one on the on where my, my cursor is, is showing him this, he's holding down with the top leg, and this is hamstring doing it against his other leg. Really simple, right? Then you can also do it with, he's they, they are pushing against the ball into the wall. So you can very simply do that. This is a standard one you see in our gym or in a clinic uh, where the person is putting his leg out. These are quads and hamstring issues. This is the Bulgarian squat. You may have done that, or sometimes it's called the split squat. And then just a leg squat on a wall, like on a leg press machine. Now we're bringing in the vectors. Remember we were talking about earlier on, we we're looking at the opposite side of the body. So you're doing both sides of the body on this. And then making it a bit more difficult where you're doing some core strength at the same time on both of these. 
Now we bring in some ball stuff in there just to add some difficulty. And she's added a bridge and uneven surface there. Again, we're using the hamstrings, you just easily bring them back. And then if you can do it with the rollback, and these are now getting closer and closer to where a person is getting back to running. Some of you may have seen this before, but this is one of our clients. He's working on this hamstring here. That's a tough exercise to do. You, you should try it. It's uh, not a walk in the park. Don't do this when you first do it. You, this is close to being close to being running, okay? This is a Nordic drop again, super, super tough. And that's pretty good. He got down to like 45 degrees. That's pretty good. If you watch some of the Aussie rules football guys, they'll actually go down to the ground and back up without touching the ground with their hands. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's super tough to do. <laughs> but if you see all my ACL patients, they're all doing this on a regular basis. We have some X bands. So this is the stability. We have a Velcro around their legs. And then she's just going to do some exercises in this position, adding resistance both ways. And again, this one, she's using her left leg and her right arm, again, using those vector slings that we were talking about earlier on. So you can co-contract co those. And some TRX machines that were attached to our multi-gym where we've got them doing, she's doing some calf raises here for her uh, strain of her calf. Then we got some dynamic stuff. So they're using the Bozu ball. She's coming in, landing hard, pushing off, coming back. Again, functional stuff so that she, we can get her back to, uh, to her running speed. I'm just gonna run a couple of quick, these are uh, hamstring tantrums. Okay, we do it against the wall, ball sometimes. That's how they start. And then we move them to this one over here. Nordic drops, uh, the one that we just saw, show you. This is a deadlift. To both Nordic drops and the straight deadlifts are really low back and hamstring glute and hamstring strengthening. Okay, he's right now just doing it to get ready. But we're going to use a trap bar and he's going to step into the trap bar and he's actually going to lift it uh, as a weight. But we just wanted him to get used to what it feels like to do the um, the deadlift. Okay. And that's what I was saying earlier, do this common origin in the back. A doctor gets missed a lot. So make sure when they're giving you exercises for your back and your leg, it doesn't not, it has to include the, the adductor muscle group. So the simple one is you just bring the foot into the side. Then we get them to do circles with that foot in the ground. And then we do circles in the air. So those are the three that we do. And then we try and get them on treadmill. And we say, okay, and we'll take a video of them from the back and we take a video from the side and we show it to them. And we'll, you know, I think you're, you're still, uh, don't have the stride length right, or we still think you're limping. And then uh, we'll go from there. All right. And then we'll just have a look at them. We can rate in our, in our treadmill right now, we can raise the elevation. So they're running uphill. We can actually do it so they're running downhill as well. And we can get them to run backwards. And uh, that was me cycling in Portugal a couple of years ago. All right. I think I'm on time. Yes, I am. Yep, right. you're on time. <laughs> um, so does anyone have any questions? So far, I have I have one. Uh, I'm going to go first because we had um, Tillman Vonderland the last three um, three sessions talking about the stretching and whatnot. And he was saying that like some of his stretching routines are like up to three hours long. And I'm like, is there sort of like a time in which you're kind of overdoing it and then you need to, you know, scale back on on stretching to get ready for, for your run? Three hours. 
I don't think I have one patient that would do that. <laughs> so my muscle groups, I typically get, and the research that is, is most current is, you know, 15 to 30 seconds of stretching three to five times. That's it. All the, ma all the major muscle groups. So if you're doing your hamstrings, your calf, your quads, uh, your low back, um, you, 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 nobody is going to spend, well, I don't know anybody that's going to spend three hours <laughs> for sure. So, to, you know, usually the, the, the rule of thumb is 15 to 30 seconds, three to five times once a day. Okay. And that's got to be for every muscle group. Uh, typically you shouldn't do it right off the hop. Like when you start, go for a run right now, you should go for a two minute run to get the blood flowing through your system, then do the stretches. Uh, so the passive stretches will delay your peak performance by two hours. So if you're the passive stretch means you're just leaning forward and holding the stretch, right? Yeah. So if you're just doing hamstrings, say, and you're just going to, and you walk, start, you do the one where you're walking across the, the, where you are, they should be active stretches for your calf, for your, uh, hamstrings, uh, quads. So say for quads, you would do some lunges, say across the field, then do your event and then do your passive stretches at the end. So active at the beginning, do some functional, uh, running, say you're going to, if you're a runner, and then at the end, do some passive stretches. You can do the same muscle group, but this time you can do it passively. If you do it passively initially, you're probably not going to have a really good time. Fair enough. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? No? Um, I have one more question. Um, you often will see people using um, items like the massage guns. Yeah. To when the, when they're injured, is there sort of when do, what are you not wanting to use something like those mas massage guns? Well, again, the recent studies that I've seen is that per, uh, continuous use of the gun has led to some breakdown of tissue. So I would minimize the use of the gun. Uh, if you use it periodically, you know, once in a blue moon, uh, yeah. but to use it on a regular basis, uh, the study showed uh, breakdown of tissue. Interesting. Ne negatively. Okay. Well, thank you. That was, I didn't know that. So don't buy one for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> we we I have mean, one. Yep. Go ahead. And I use it once in a blue moon i right. hardly remember to do it and then yeah. and some so, people you know feel, feel great with it uh but there is a chance that it could lead to some damaged uh tissue fair enough okay well i'm gonna hit stop recording if everyone if no one has any other questions okay